you who managed to join the webinar and uh, spend your valuable time to learn a little bit more about the socioeconomic benefit analysis and the experience we have in various countries. So we are facing more challenges than the last two years and we almost learned how to live with COVID-19 and we are facing more new challenges. Before it was climate change which continued the COVID-19 now we have the conflict in Russia and Ukraine and the high inflation and looming economic recession. So there are many, many priorities and governments are struggling how to deal with all these parallel uh, problems and issues and how to reach the economic uh, growth and development at the same time. So will be many, many competing priorities and uh, the geospatial information is a tool which can help, but it's not the obvious direct solution of the issues which we have. So we need a little bit to prepare better for how to make the case that the investment in uh, geospatial information and technologies can help governments to meet their priorities. And this webinar is we'll examine the recently developed methodologies with the support of the World Bank and um, team of experts and how it has been used in several countries, what are the challenges and what were the success stories. So let's keep it short and uh, start directly with the first speaker. It's Katrin Kelm from the World Bank. She was the initiator of all this uh, methodologies development in support of IGF implementation, Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. And Katrin will speak about socioeconomic impact assessment within the framework of the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework and the methodology developed by the World Bank. Katrin is um, Land Administration Specialist, Senior Land Administration Specialist at the World Bank, currently assigned to work in East Asia and Pacific region. She is a land lawyer by background and she is leading a global geospatial project which is focusing on support to the countries to develop IGF implementation country level action plans and to enhance the support, capacity building and help the countries to find financial instruments for supporting the implementation of IGF. Catherine, the floor is yours. And thank you for making possible to join this webinar. Catherine was traveling from US to Vietnam last night, so she make all the efforts to finish the mission in Vietnam today and to join this webinar. So thanks, Catherine, very much for your time and for your energy to to keep learning this. Thank, Thank you, you, Rumiana, and also to um, the UNECE and CART Burkett and FAO, all of the organizers. Thank you for inviting me. And a very warm greeting uh, to everyone who's joining us. Um, I'm joining from the Red River Delta in Vietnam, and it's um, really great to be back on the road, back doing the field work that so many of us are energized by doing. Um, Uh, I'm going to set the stage for um, a very exciting panel discussion on um, the IGIF framework, provide some background on the World Bank methodology, and most importantly, you're going to hear um, from the people who are actually doing country level implementation. So as Rumiana said, the relevance of geospatial technology and is increasing. Um, whether we're talking about global issues, um, trying to meet the sustainable development goals, um, dealing with climate change, um, and increasingly down to the local level, whether it's digital transformation agendas, the city agenda, um, or precision agriculture, everything requires accurate and up-to-date up geospatial information. Um, but we face investment challenges. If we're talking about spatial data infrastructure, we end up competing with um, traditional infrastructure that has well-established business lines. So we're competing um, with energy and transport. And these sectors are very well developed um, and, and the, the importance of them, the benefits, the cost benefit ratios, all of those are pretty, are very well known. Um, it's less so for this new data infrastructure and spatial data infrastructure in particular. And 
what we have found is that we need more evidence to be able to convince decision makers, whether it's the prime minister, our own ministers, or in particular, the minister of finance, um, to finance the significant investment that is needed. And five years ago, the World Bank entered into a partnership with the United Nations Statistics Department and the Committee of Experts on Geospatial Information Management. And the aim is to bridge this geospatial digital divide that we see growing. And the first step was to prepare an overarching geospatial framework. So in Europe, you have the INSPIRE Directive. And without debating the merits of the INSPIRE Directive, um, what we found from the World Bank is it did, the INSPIRE Directive provides the political level recognition and justification that's needed, and also provided the framework or structure for developing the SDIs. And we as the World Bank, as a financial institution, could come in and finance the investments relatively easily, whereas globally, that did not um, exist. There wasn't this framework to engage effectively at the country level. So the first aim was to develop this overarching ge geospatial framework. And then the second was to assist countries to implement and operationalize this framework, um, and particularly to access financing. So a year later, in August of 2018, the United Nations member states adopted the IGIF. And you can see here the puzzle pieces that provide a very holistic view of geospatial information management. It's not just technology data systems. It looks across three areas of influence, which you see on the left-hand side of the puzzle piece, covering governance, technology, and people. All of these have to be in synergy and work together to really have holistic um, views and holistic investment in the spatial data infrastructure. So at the World Bank, um, as the IGIF was being developed, um, together with partners such as um, Rumiana and the FAO, we really thought about country level implementation. And we've developed a four step methodology to work um, with countries, to work with cities um, as well, um, to implement the IGIF. It starts with a baseline assessment, then it looks at the business case, particularly the socioeconomic impact assessment, and finally results in an action and an investment plan. So the first step is, is to use a diagnostic tool we've developed to provide an as-is assessment across these nine strategic pathways. Where is the country or the city or the region today? Um, and, it, and we use this then to prepare the country report. And at that point, we find it a very effective way to start engaging stakeholders. So not just the National Mapping Agency, the Cadaster Agency, or whoever is in charge of the spatial data infrastructure, but to start reaching out to other stakeholders who are just as important. And that's done through a consultation and verification workshop. The second stage is to look at the um, alignment to policy drivers. And this is very important to link it to what is the government's strategic objectives and what are the international commitments and how does geospatial information support those goals. And this work is key for communications and awareness, particularly with decision makers. And John is going to talk a bit later about communicating effectively and how do we take something very technical like geospatial information and make it understandable and actionable um, by decision makers. So this method, this template helps work through prioritizing where geospatial information fits within a, a country or a municipality, municipality's priorities. The next stage um, is I would say the most complicated. It takes us as the geospatial technical community outside of our comfort zone. So we're looking at the socioeconomic business case, looking at it qualitatively and quantitatively and needing to have the right types of assessments to be able to talk about a cost benefit ratio or a return on investment. So speaking the language of financiers, of economists, whether it's the Ministry of Finance or coming to the World's Bank, 
need to be able to speak the language um, of the economists. And part of the process is trying to identify the benefits and using a filtering process. So geospatial covers many sectors, as you see in the pink. Basically, every ministry in a country or department in a country could or should use geospatial information in some way. Underneath that in the orange, you see all of these use cases that exist. So the um, alignment to policy drivers helps prioritize what are the sectors and use cases and the socioeconomic impact um, helps, to, helps to say what are the, the impacts that um, can come soonest or have the biggest impact. And that filters down then into the green, which are the actions and investments. Um, how to prioritize them, how to sequence them, and ultimately how to access the financing that is needed for them. And so we prepared some tools to assist us. Again, this is outside of our normal comfort zone. Um, so we've developed additional tools which are available. So green growth use cases. This is um, looking at examples from other countries. It's a compilation of other countries that um, have calculated the benefits of geospatial information and the investment in geospatial information management. Um, and this is particularly helpful if you do not have time um, or data needed to actually do a hands-on in-depth socioeconomic impact analysis. And then because you really do need to bring in economists or financing expertise, um, We've provided information on how to go through the cost benefit analysis and some of the generic process description because geospatial also has its intricacies. Um, so just bringing an economist and in an economist to your team doesn't mean that they will know what to do with geospatial information. So th these three additional tools will help um, teams, whether it's from the World Bank or from the National Mapping Agency, the Cadaster Agency, whomever. Um, to come in and, and think through the socioeconomic, the benefits and the impacts that are, are needed. Um, I'm, here's an example from work we re, um, recently completed in Mongolia. Um, and we used it as a financing justification. So again, speaking the language of the Ministry of Finance and the financial departments, um, what is the cost benefit ratio? What is the return on investment? And we put that in the context of the World Bank infrastructure project model, the project life cycle and the discount rates. This now allows us to communicate with the Ministry of Finance, with the World Bank and with other um, financial institutions, allows us to speak on the same level that transport and energy and traditional infrastructure projects already engage in. The dialogue that is really um, quite common for to those sectors, but relatively new for geospatial. And finally, all of that work is then um, put into the action plan, which sets out the actions and the investments in very sequenced and structured manner. And on top of that, um, putting um, a very detailed um, investment plan um, and the investment plan that comes out is what we would call, it's a bankable plan, meaning you can go to the Ministry of Finance, to the World Bank, to other um, lenders or group, groups and say, here is a well thought out plan that you can invest in with some reliability of knowing what needs to be done in what order and what is the financing justification for it. So again, the example from Mongolia, where they um, looked at the e-government, the digital transformation agenda, and they put it through the geospatial lens. So their vision is this geo-driven e-government and innovation. And a very clear five-year um, sequenced, detailed plan, reform plan, the costs that associated with that, and that's been transferred then into the new World Bank Finance Digital Development Project, which will pick up and finance some of the key investments. 
And that project is being delivered to the board, the World Bank board next month. And it specifically mentions the IGIF. So it is the first lending project at the World Bank, um, which builds on the IGIF and references it. And here you can see an example of, of what the um, investment plan looks like. So it's very detailed. Um, and it looks from the financial perspective, you can see in the red, red circle, very detailed. And is it capital or recurrent costs? If it's recurrent costs, that's something um, that needs to be done internally with the government. How do you manage your own financing? But many times for capital level investments, there's not enough uh, cap capital available. And in that case, it is worthwhile then to go to um, the World Bank or another multilateral development bank or other, um, other development partners um, to have them buy in. And when, when we develop this, it's not only for the World Bank. In fact, the World Bank is really the last resort um, that a country should go to. You should look at the own country's own resources, um, look at potential bilateral agreements, which are grants, and then whatever's left over, then consider going to the World Bank. So we, we make it in a way that, that different partners can come in and finance different pieces um, for, more, for better coordination. And you'll hear um, um, an example um, of that from Moldova. So where um, this methodology is being implemented um, across sev several partner organizations, we've made the, the methodology and the documents available to whoever wants to use it. Um, and we see it being used and relevant um, with, you know, whether it's high, middle or low income countries, the methodology works. Um, and finally, in this section, linking it to financing. So just to give a bit of background and thinking about the World Bank project cycle. So if it's determined that capital level investment is really needed, the easiest way or the, sort of the immediate action is to add um, to or guide existing projects. So this is the case for Moldova, for Serbia. You'll, you'll hear about those later. Um, in the session. Um, if you're looking at projects in the pipeline, um, that's certainly something that you're able to do, but that's 12 to 24 months of development. That's quite a long time. And if it's brand new financing, that's a minimum of 18 months. And what is very important with the new financing is that projects start with analytics. And these IGIF tools, the templates, the methodology, provide the basis of the analytics that are needed to start engaging with the World Bank um, on securing investment for SDIs and for geos geospatial information management. Um, and my final section is going to look at some of the resources we've developed. So in addition to the templates, which are readily available, um, we also developed um, a blended learning program which uses the um, World Bank's online learning campus, the OLC, um, where um, there's a self-paced e-learning and there's also this massive open online course or MOOCs. So these are two, um, two courses or two ways um, for capacity building knowledge sharing that the World Bank provides globally. And, the um, self-paced online learning course is still available for people to um, access. It's free of charge, although in order to get the certificate, I believe there is a, a, a nominal fee, but it's not very much. Um, but again, this, the, the course really follows the IGIF and helps explain it. So you see in the upper left-hand side, begin with the value of geospatial information, so very basic information. Um, particularly for those who are not as familiar with geospatial and the importance of it. Um, module two down below in the bottom left is introducing the IGIF. Again, relatively high level for decision makers. Module three, solving the puzzle, is understanding the implementation guide. So that's really for the practitioners to understand what the IGIF is and how to implement it. And then module four um, is creating a country level action plan. So going through that methodology that I just shared with you. And then what we added um, recently was the benefits of geospatial information. And it's a tutorial 
on conducting the socioeconomic impact assessment. And there's a six stage methodology and it goes through that. So whether you're the technical resource person from the National Mapping Agency, or it's a, it's a new economist, it's an economist coming in who's not familiar with geospatial information, it really goes through step by step how to use the World Bank methodology and, and the templates for the um, impact assessment. Again, available um, online through the OLC. Um, we also have on record this virtual knowledge exchange. It was two events um, held last year. So through that, you would use the e-learning module. And then we had two hour live sessions, facilitated online forum, um, was very well received. Over a hundred countries, uh, participants from a, over a hundred countries um, joined in. And the presentations are available um, in English, Spanish, Korean, French, and Russian. Um, so again, please use that as a resource, very easy to access online on the OLC. Um, and finally, um, just a reminder or, or a prompt for ev everyone, uh, again, you can go to the Open Learning Campus, the OLC website, you can um, access the templates, you can access the knowledge materials, um, but you do have to register. So be aware to join OLC, you have to register. Um, also where we've made available the templates, which maybe is um, easier to access, is through um, the World Bank, the Korea office, and the Korea Green Growth Trust Fund, um, which supported a lot of the work, particularly country level implementation and, and the knowledge materials. Um, they've also made available the tools and templates on the Green Growth Trust Fund. Um, website. So if you take note of those, you can access, download, use the materials, and please feel free to reach out to me, um, and I will provide you as much guidance and, and support as I can. Um, so again, the IGIF is really um, a good framework to use. It's holistic, and we um, very much welcome you using the tools and the templates we've prepared. Um, for implementation, particularly at the country and subnational level. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. A lot of work done, like it's like a movie. It's so much work for so short period of time. So thanks very much for going through the methodology and the tools available, because those tools are good for the government. They're good for consultants who are hired to do the work, because otherwise they start from the beginning, discovering a way how to do it. So it's now straightforward, it's working well, it can be modified if people think so, but it's really, really useful and a lot of work done so far. And we'll see several practical examples now from various countries, how it was work, um, how it worked out and uh, what were the results. So our next speaker is Andrew Kut. He is a chief executive and principal consultant in consulting where United Kingdom based company. He has over 30 years of experience in the development and use of information systems and specialized in uh, management of location enabled applications. And he has held senior management positions both at the private and the uh, public sector in UK and in Seychelles. Uh, his experience lies in strategy development and implementation and return on investment and market assessment. And he has undertaken an extensive range of strategic assignments in East Asia, Eastern Europe, Southern Africa, North and uh, South America, and the Middle East. And uh, he has been working with me, with FAO, with World Bank, with uh, various other uh, development partners, land, um, partners, land information in New Zealand and in Ordnance Survey. Uh, Andy will present a practical experience, which is very recent, from the socioeconomic impact assessment in Moldova. Uh, and just a, a word, like uh, I'm working in this team in Moldova from the World Bank side, and they had three, four projects supporting NSDI. And before developing the action plan, it was quite hard to understand which donor is doing what and if there is overlapping. And there was kind of overlapping. But once you have the action plan, it's very clear who is doing which part. And then there is no any way of overlapping. It's complementing activi uh, activities. So, Andrew, the floor is yours. And then we later we have Maria. 
uh, from Moldova, who is a panelist, so we'll have a good picture from Moldova. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you have uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Rumiana, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you all this morning. Catherine's given us a, a, a brilliant introduction, um, so I don't <clears throat> need to spend too much work, I think, on the, uh, uh, the World Bank methodology, but just to explain from the uh, Moldova perspective, uh, we used all four of the, uh, the World Bank tools, um, but I'm going to concentrate on the work that we did around the alignment to policy drivers, and then really how that fed into the, uh, the economics assessment. Catherine has explained that we have these templates. They've been put together over three or four years now, and hopefully give other developing countries in particular uh, a good kickstart into uh, uh, how to present these things. And as we like to describe it, uh, it's looking to make uh, the uh, assessments uh, finance ready because uh, even if you're producing this for the purposes of your own government they're still going to want to understand what the uh, return on investment is and particularly if you're going for uh, donor funding or other types of external funding this will be uh, an essential tool for you explaining uh, the need for investment so uh, what we've uh, what we've got here uh, when we look at the stages is that we started in Moldova looking at uh, the baseline assessment um, and this is uh, the results that we came up with and uh, I would draw your attention probably to the fact that from a data point of view particularly with the uh, the, the help of the uh, Norwegian government uh, the work that Kart Bouquet has, uh, has sponsored in Moldova uh, it's in a very good position. 60% um, uh, is a good score for any developing country, considering to reach 100% uh, is probably not even achieved by the most developed countries uh, in the world as yet. And also good governance structures. But where the uh, current state falls down, you can see there uh, at three o'clock on this, uh, this wheel here uh, is around, uh, around finance. And so, therefore, this emphasizes why the, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, socioeconomic um, uh, maturity is, uh, is, is so important. In order to make sure that we're focusing on the right areas when we do the socioeconomic impact assessment, we need to go through the strategic alignment, which uh, Catherine has described. Uh, and Actually, Moldova is reasonably typical in this respect. Uh, land administration uh, is, of course, critically important, but increasingly agriculture and forestry are making much more heavy use of geospatial information. Uh, environmental management, obviously, with, with net zero targets is, is, uh, is, is also important. But one of the areas that perhaps we don't recognize is that economic master planning requires and uses uh, a lot of geospatial information for analysis. And without the base work being done to create that geospatial analysis, then we probably as countries make uh, the, the wrong decisions. You can see that there are a lot of other sectors which are also uh, important. And I think it's uh, very uh, key that we consider things like energy and utilities, because some of these are areas where perhaps because they're controlled by the public, public uh, the private sector um, we don't include them as stakeholders and including those kind of commercial um, players in the work that we do is is vitally important so we need it i think as as catherine has pointed out because it's to do overall with making sure that we focus when we look at these things at what's required uh, for government, for business, and for citizens. And quite honestly, when we walk into uh, a lot of countries to carry out consultancy, we sometimes see that perhaps that wider perspective has not been looked at in the detail that perhaps is, uh, is, is necessary. So having those three communities in mind um, is, uh, is very important. The other thing is, 
that um, it's a long-term investment. That's why we call these things spatial data infrastructures. They're infrastructures in very much the same way as, as roads and uh, utilities are. We just don't see, perhaps in a physical terms, uh, the infrastructure in quite, in quite the same way. We've developed these additional tools to try and help uh, the process. And we, we have used these within the, uh, the work that we un undertook in, uh, uh, in Moldova. The results of the, the analysis that we undertook, and this involved uh, a lot of detailed sessions with uh, the key stakeholders, where we looked at what is generally easier, which is to ask them to explain the benefits of geospatial in qualitative terms often they can more easily speak about those kind of things and then trying to pick out those areas that we can most easily quantify and often they're to do with productivity but they could be to do also with uh, increasing revenue um, and they could be for other kinds of benefits which are still quantifiable things like what are the benefits of, of reaching an emergency incident more quickly the the results of that uh, kind of change uh, with address information and uh, uh, and navigation information is that you save lives and there are statistics that have been put together internationally to give uh, what that means in in uh, financial terms so we looked at uh, areas such as uh, improved data sharing there are so many use cases where addresses are important and it's a very basic form of, of geospatial information. Going back to what I've just said, emergency response uh, is another area where we can identify quantifiable um, uh, efficiencies. Uh, geodetic surveying through the use of a cause network. That's uh, another area where surveying becomes quicker and, uh, uh, and requires uh, less manpower. The use of digital mapping for citizens. We, we all use, I think, on, on smartphones, uh, digital data for various applications. And there's been a study carried out internationally to look at what's called the willingness to pay. So how much uh, are a citizen's willing to pay for having that kind of information available? Uh, and we've used a, a process called benefits transfer in Moldova to look at what that might be uh, worth to the, uh, uh, the citizens uh, in that country. Similarly, we've gone through other areas which uh, have also been quantified in other territories. Uh, and then we've uh, looked at scaling using uh, standard uh, criteria to evaluate that for, for Moldova, um, including things like the, uh, the value of uh, open geospatial data. We identified something like 50 use cases. We only actually have uh, quantified the nine that are shown on that slide. And so that represents less than 20%. So what we can say is when we look at the return on investment, it's probably higher because uh, there is that volume that we haven't, for reasons of time or lack of data, not been able to uh, quantify. The results for Moldova, I, I think, are quite impressive. Uh, when we look at the what are called the discounted benefits, and this means bringing, taking into account the fact that uh, money is worth less in the future uh, than it is in, in, at the present time because of uh, factors such as you might invest that in, in other projects. Uh, and the benefit to cost ratio that we, we uh, um, evaluated was a four to one return on investment. So for every one US dollar, uh, you would receive over the, uh, the the period of the project, in this case, a 12 year uh, period, um, $4 back in efficiency savings uh, and in increases in revenue. So that work then fed into the, uh, the action plan uh, and the action plan uh, with the investment uh, based upon uh, the figures that I've just shown was completed in November 2021. And as uh, uh, Rumiana has said, we tried to include all of the initiatives that were going on in parallel, particularly the EU twinning project, which was looking at particular um, technical aspects of uh, improving capabilities. 
uh, in, uh, in Moldova. The very, very uh, useful and, and uh, uh, pleasing thing about Moldova is that uh, with the help of Kartvaket, the World Bank and the European Union, the implementation of the action plan, which is really where the benefits start to flow from, has already started. Uh, the European Union project carries on for the rest of 2022, uh, and they're already implementing things around uh, uh, improvements uh, in areas such as uh, the uh, uh, the geoportal in in Moldova. Kart Bouquet has commissioned some further work around uh, looking at the the most economically economically effective way of being able to revise maps, uh, and uh, so that the investment that's already been made is not wasted uh, and the world bank is tendering at the moment for capacity enhancement because we identified in the action plan a series of places where uh, the uh, the the moldovan team which is very capable needed to be uh, enhanced uh, in order to uh, to manage uh, the the investments uh, that uh, we have proposed and I think one of the, the last learning points I'd like to make on this is that uh, the action plan and the socioeconomic impact assessment uh, are living documents. They have most value if you are actually able to uh, use them on an ongoing basis and refine them uh, on an ongoing basis. So what are our key takeaways? Well, I think, first of all, we've used a standards based approach. Uh, drawn from the worlds of finance and, uh, and economics. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis uh, is, uh, uh, is the particular technique that we use. Uh, and that, that improves the, uh, the uh, credibility of this with um, uh, interactions with uh, economists and, and, and with financial people. We've actually quantified uh, a number of the benefits Often people say the benefits are intangible of uh, geospatial. Uh, I don't think that's right. And there's an increasing body of evidence uh, that we can lean on to, to do that. Uh, we looked at a wide range of use cases because what we do is a horizontal technology. Geospatial touches many, many sectors. And uh, we have sought to make it across those various sectors and also look at the benefits, not only to government, but to the commercial sector and uh, and to citizens. Uh, and I think underscoring the point that Catherine made earlier, this then makes uh, what we've done finance ready. It's something that can be presented to uh, the decision makers uh, in Moldova in, in a very easily digestible way. And so with that, I'll, uh, uh, I'll tie up and hand back to you, Rumiana. Thank you very much, Andy. Thanks a lot for sharing the experience in Moldova, how it was done, how we are using there the templates which Catherine mentioned before and the standard methodology. Uh, I think we don't have uh, any urgent questions, so we'll continue with the next presentation. We'll keep the questions toward the end. Um, so, well, the next presentation is about justifying investments in national mapping using fit for purpose approach. And the speaker is uh, Simon Wills. He is a senior consultant working now with uh, Consulting Web. Uh, Simon has more than 25 years of experience in developing and use of information systems and focus mainly on the location enabled applications and statistical modeling of special data. He's a geologist by background and worked in Botswana in the field of remote sensing for many years, undertaking both managerial and senior consultancy work for the local distributor of ESRI and ERDA software. Now he's working with the team of Consulting Ware, and he was part of the team for which Catherine was speaking about the socioeconomic benefit analysis in uh, Mongolia. He is supporting Kyrgyzstan, in implementation of IGIF and providing advices to the government of Vietnam at the moment for using the land information systems. So Simon, the floor is yours. You also have 15 minutes. Please try to keep as the previous speakers um, the time. So thank you very much. We have a lot of speakers today, so we, we are on time at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rumiana. And um, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm 
First, so today I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been undertaking in Kurdistan recently, which has been funded by the Norwegian National Mapping Agency and our local partners in Kurdistan are the State Agency for Land Resources. Um, before I get into the main presentation, I just need to acknowledge my colleague Robin McLaren, who was part of the work with me and developed a lot of this presentation. So initially the project was looking at the current state of geospatial and looking at the development of an NSDI in Kurdistan. Um, as Andy mentioned, we follow the principles of the IGIF and use the World Bank tools um, to conduct a baseline assessment, looking at the state of geospatial within Kurdistan. Um, and following on from this, we took, and we took another piece of work which looked at the sustainability of base mapping in Kurdistan and how they could use the fit for purpose approach to justify investments in base mapping and also investments in an NSDI. Um, so this additional work came about as a result of some of the findings from the baseline assessment, which I'll just very quickly run through so you get an idea and a bit of a flavor of what's happening within Kurdistan. So this slide summarizes the main um, strengths and weaknesses um, that we found from our assessment. And some of the main weaknesses um, really are around, there's a lack of visibility and awareness of what geospatial can bring um, to Kurdistan. They don't have a sustainable business model to fund investment in development. And because of that, there's an over-reliance on donor funding to get uh, geospatial projects up and off the ground. And geospatial tends to operate in isolation within the country. Uh, there's a lot going on, but it's all very, very project driven or contained within different ministries and within different departments. What we found is that the government doesn't really understand the true value of geospatial. It actually sees geospatial as a cost rather than something that can add value and bring both financial and societal benefits to the country. To date, there's been no work to undertake socioeconomic benefits analysis of geospatial within the country, although recently um, I've been working with colleagues in Bishkek to start them along, the, along this path. So as a result, we started to look at a project which was undertaken several years ago. Uh, and develop a few use cases that could help demonstrate the benefits of geospatial investment uh, based on the particular outputs of this project. The project in question was undertaken in 2018, and it was an orthophoto project undertaken by the, the, the Norwegian National Mapping Authority, where they delivered line mapping, digital orthophotos, and elevation models. And we wanted to look at the particular value of the ortho photo component of this project and what benefits it could bring to different scenarios and different users within government and whether or not it was both viable economically and desirable to collect similar data in the future. So we actually looked initially at two different use cases, um, one focusing on land registration and cadaster. And the second one looking at disaster risk management, focusing on earthquake hazards. I'm only going to talk today about the land registration case. And part of this work was also to help our colleagues in Kyrgyzstan understand how to develop use cases and to give them the tools to help explain the benefits of geospatial to government. And both myself and my colleague from the Norwegian Mapping Authority are out in Bishkek in a few weeks' time to continue this work with our colleagues uh, in Bishkek. So the land registration and cadastral use case. What we're looking at here are the benefits from capturing cadaster within the country using digital orthophotos. Currently within Kyrgyzstan and in many other places, all cadaster is captured using traditional survey methods. And we wanted to introduce the possibility of moving this to using digital orthophotos in a fit for purpose approach. So what I mean by fit for purpose is focus on the purpose of the data collection, to be flexible in how the data is collected, and also 
to look at incremental improvements of both capturing the data and the use of the data. So in other words, to capture data that's appropriate for the use that it's being used for and of a necessary standard for its intended use. Very often we see data captured at massively high resolution or standards where actually it's not particularly needed to that level. So this slide shows the number of plots, um, both within the capital city of Bishkek and in the wider area that was covered by the 2018 ortho photo uh, mapping project undertaken by the Norwegian Mapping Agency. And at this point in time, when this snapshot was taken, the capital Bishkek has around about 150,000 registered plots um, plus there's another 63,000 that still need registration. And the, the ones that need registration are either new formal developments that haven't been registered yet, or in many cases, informal development. And our colleagues in the agency also estimate that around about 60%, 60 percent of the plots that have already been captured need reassessment for quality improvement purposes. So you can see the scale of the issue here, uh, both within the capital and within the wider sort of catchment area of the author photographs. We're looking at a, a well over 1 million plots that need some form of registration. And this is not even taking into account the entirety of Kyrgyzstan. If we look at translating that into financial terms, this, this is straight financial terms. We're not, we're not looking at the time taken um, as well here. So if we were to use traditional survey uh, methodologies to capture this data, we estimate the total cost for capturing both the new registrations and the quality improvements would cost the country around 67 million US dollars. And that's using a, a figure of around $53 per building or per parcel to be surveyed. If we use a fit for purpose approach using digital author photos, that cost becomes around 116.8 million. So we're saving around $50 million here. Uh, and that's estimated built around a cost of around $13.5 per building or per parcel. And that includes the cost of the initial data capture. Now, the savings there don't take into account other factors. So for example, when the plots are formally registered, there will be probably an increase in revenue from property taxation. It also doesn't take into account the benefits that will accrue because the time taken to capture these plots using digital author photographs will be a lot faster than using traditional survey. We also looked at, or undertook a similar exercise on potential new registrations required in the capital on a yearly basis. And to do this, we looked at the population, the estimated population growth rate in Bishkek over the next 15 years. And within Kyrgyzstan, that's estimated to be running at around 2.15% per year. So that translates into potentially another four to 6,000 new registrations needed on an annual basis um, on top of the catch up work that I've just mentioned. So just on the new registrations alone, we're looking at saving between 185 and 250,000 a year uh, by using a fit for purpose approach uh, and digital order photographs. There's other potential benefits to this approach. Um, and one potential one is a reduction in the number and cost of land related court cases. And our experience in other countries suggests that this could be around 40% saving currently on these. So we're looking at around $300,000 a year. There's also other benefits um, around the increased security of tenure. Um, so with increased security of tenure achieved across the country and more trust achieved or more trust established, should I say, in the land records mined by the government, institutions such as mortgage providers will provide more loans to property owners due to the reduction in risk because of that increased security of tenure. And this will in turn lead to more economic development and, and encourage a much more vibrant land market to be developed in Kyrgyzstan. 
there are of course some prerequisites to all this um and this is mostly around the legal and regulatory framework in Kurdistan and also political backing to make these changes. So the current legal reg regulatory framework for the registration of properties imposes strict technical procedures and corresponding accuracy requirements. And we've already been talking to colleagues there about having these modified to provide the flexibility that would be required by undertaking a fit for purpose approach. But also we have to have to be an engagement strategy. Um, in, and that is especially around the surveying community, actually, because they will see this as a, as a threat to their livelihood and to their jobs. And we will also need political backing. Th this approach will only be successful if there is a strong political commitment to move forward. And luckily, that commitment does seem to be growing within Kyrgyzstan. We also need to bear in mind there are alternatives to flying author photographs using traditional fixed wing methods such as UAVs and high-res satellites. At the moment, though, these only appear to be cost-effective over small areas, but this will no doubt change. And one suggestion we have made is the government looks at using satellite imagery for change detection purposes in order to pinpoint areas where new data is needed so that they can make more effective use of budgets when they're looking to uh, fly or capture other photographs. So I'll stop there. Um, and just finish off by thanking numerous people who've been involved in this work over the past few years. Um, so I will stop sharing and thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Uh, so now we are going to the next presentation, which will be focusing on how we are communicating these use cases. So you see, it's a teamwork with different skills. You need people who know the business, you need people who knows technology, you need economists, and then you need also to have people who know how to present these results and how to communicate. So you attract the government and they understand that NSDI is not a cost only, but it's also there are a lot of benefits and uh, very difficult decisions have to be made in the next uh, several months with all this crisis in which we're living now. And all depends on what kind of decisions the governments will make and uh, the geospatial information really can help decision makers to get the right decisions. So uh, John is a global geospatial strategy advisor. I think many of you know John for many years. Previously, uh, he was employed in British Army and more recently he was working as director of international engagement uh, in Great Britain's National Mapping Agency Ordnance Survey. In his work, his um, advocate for the implementation of integrated geospatial in, uh, information framework. Elsewhere, he chairs uh, UNSD and geospatial world-led collaboration of government and businesses developing a future geospatial concept, uh, the geospatial knowledge infrastructure, and contributes to the SDGs Data Alliance work, which is supporting countries to develop IGF country-level action plans. John, you are super excellent in uh, showing the governments how to present all these use cases and the benefits. I was listening several several of your presentations and very impressive. And it's really people need special skills to communicate those results. Like one thing is to have good data, good use cases, but how you are communicating these cases. I think it's a very useful presentation now following the chain of the others. And John, you have also 15 minutes. I cannot hear you. I don't know the others. Right. Uh, that, I think that's better. Uh, it's no, WebEx it's now. Let me <laughs> let me just try yes. sharing and yes. check that you can um, see what I'm sharing. Okay. So, have you got got that on screen? Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so um, well, thank you for that introduction, uh, and, and it's been a real pleasure to be involved in the Norwegian-sponsored project. Um, in my case, in Georgia, and Georgia is an absolutely fascinating um, country. 
many of us have not been there. In fact, we're going next week for the project closure mission. But it's a fairly small country with a small population uh, trying to align itself with Europe, a strong intent for Europe, uh, European integration with a GDP per head that's far lower than any member of the European Union uh, and with extensive forests and agricultural land. And I think that just set, sets the scene um, for Georgia. The projects that Norway has been involved in are not just consultancy. It's not just about developing a country level action plan. So starting in 2014, the uh, Maps for Sustainable uh, Land Management in Georgia project um, was, was established. And that uh, was effectively creating a terrain model and creating uh, ortho photos for, for much of Georgia, about two thirds of Georgia. Uh, that was continued with a project in 2017, which looked to create uh, effectively vector data from the ortho photos um, and to uh, provide some form of dissemination capability uh, in order to make sure that users could get the, the um, data that had been uh, created. And this was all managed by NAPR, the National Agency for Public Registry um, in Georgia, with whom we worked closely. And uh, the third part of all of this was the IGIF based country level action plan um, for Georgia. And that had um, four parts that you've heard about from Catherine, the baseline assessment, uh, strategic alignment, country level action plan, and socio-economic impact assessment. So a really interesting project that delivered a country level action plan, but also delivered financial arguments through the socio-economic impact assessment uh, that were necessary uh, and will be necessary to get the resources necessary to deliver the action plan. Now, I was involved in helping to create a communications plan for the first of those uh, two elements, the first two of those elements, the creation of all of that data. Um, the, the ortho photos, the vector imagery, uh, the terrain elevation data, um, because in a sense, what we didn't have is sustainability built into all of that data that had been collected. Um, and at a mid uh, project review, we identified the need for more sustainability. And one of those aspects was to be able to communicate um, the, the, the benefits of the geospatial information that had been collected. But also in parallel, the action plan, the country level action plan uh, had generated about 52 different actions, uh, had documented about 75 different use cases. Uh, and the package, the whole package there with the socio-economic impact assessment had uh, had calculated benefits of benefit cost ratio between 2.6 and 3.8. And I'm going to just touch on both of these as I go through, because I want to just demonstrate the relevance of the socio-economic impact assessment um, and the communications and how they are very much um, tied together. So Catherine showed this slide with the integrated geospatial information framework on the left um, and I've highlighted sort of knowledge decisions development and you could highlight value the bits around the outside because ultimately what we are trying to do is trying to deliver the benefits the pictures on the right hand side geospatial information on its own is valueless um, it's only of value when it is used to solve problems uh, and, and support individuals um, with their lives or whatever it might be. So ultimately, we have to turn all of our language into the language that people on the right understand. Um, and that's where good communications has a real role to play. But I also want to just link communications and engagement with financial here, because you you have to have something good to communicate and we'll get that from our uh, work in in particular in the in the financial area um, with the SEIA uh, but equally there's no point in conducting a socio-economic impact assessment if we can't then communicate the outcomes uh, from that assessment 
Now, in the IGIF, uh, there is a lot more detail about what communications and engagement is all about. I'm showing it on the slide here. Um, and there's also a, a, if you like, a sort of process, a number of key actions to develop a communications uh, plan for, a, um, for, for the IGIF, for the action plan, or for any other geospatial um, project. Uh, and these are quite useful, and, and the IGIF has a series of tools to help develop a country communications plan or a communications plan. And the work in Georgia to build their communications plan was built upon this IGIF uh, model and the tools. So, in a sense, it was fairly simple, a review of existing communications literature. Uh, for the existing NSDI communications uh, plan, looking at that and, and other related documents to really understand what communication uh, was going on in Georgia at the time. The, the building of a stakeholder matrix, trying to understand who the key stakeholders were um, and why they were key stakeholders so that communications could be targeted appropriately. A stakeholder engagement workshop, actually talking to some of these stakeholders to really understand what was important to them in terms of messaging. Um, and then an overarching engagement strategy and the preparation of a more detailed communications plan. Now, I'm not going to go through all of that. I'm going to pick up some of it. Um, and I want to just start with thinking about our objectives in communications. And this was um, specifically in Georgia. Um, we needed to create widespread stakeholder awareness in the value and relevance of the project outcomes to Georgia. We needed people to understand that this was valuable to the country. We needed to increase user demand for the data that had been produced. User demand um, creates more user demand, creates a, a sort of, um, if you like, snowballing effect of its own. So we needed to increase user demand. Um, we needed to create policymaker awareness in the need to invest um, in the sustainability of these project outcomes. Um, and this is back to uh, understanding the values, the benefits, um, and the and the costs. And then we wanted to link the work that had been done in creating lots of data for Georgia with the value going forward that the IGIF country level action plan was going to bring. So those were the four communications objectives that we developed. Now, talking about stakeholders here, there are, of course, in any country, hundreds of stakeholders. And we had to determine um, using IGIF methodology, uh, which were the important ones. And, and the tools enable us to do that. And what we're really trying to do is under those with, uh, understand which of those have a real high influence. Because if they have high influence, then these are the ones that may be able to support us uh, achieve our um, communications objectives. Um, and there are those with high influence that are interested. Great, fantastic, use them. And there are those that are high influence that might not be interested, but we actually need to get them interested um, and playing a role. So a full uh, stakeholder analysis um, was done. And we took that a stage further, actually, uh, to then understand what it was those particular organizations sought um, from, uh, or rather, what those particular organizations' outcomes and priorities were, what their strategies were, um, and how geospatial might play a role in that. Um, and we looked at the whether they were high influence, high interest or not, yes. Uh, the impact we were trying to achieve through communications, the ability to collaborate with them, um, potential blockers, and the strategy we were going to take communications wise. And I've, I've grayed these out a bit because a communications plan tends to be not something that you release publicly. Um, these sorts of things are, are, are a little bit private and that's why you can't see detail, except where I've linked it with the Ministry of Finance. And the reason is because the subject matter today is obviously uh, around the socioeconomic impact assessments. Um, and we had with the Ministry of Finance a desired impact um, we wanted them to have awareness of the relevance and value of the project outcomes. 
Um, but we also wanted them to support investment for the future, the country level action plan. And, and so each different stakeholder is likely to have a, a different um, communications target, if you like, different, different initiatives taken, um, and then grouped together because uh, we, we have to group these um, organizations together to have best effect. And key here is aligning with national policy. If we don't understand national policy, we don't understand government priorities. If we don't understand government priorities, we won't get the communications plan right because we won't be aligning geospatial with and the benefits of geospatial um, with those um, th with those those priorities. So we came up with three com consistent strategic messages. Now I'm only going to uh, look at one of them in detail, and that's the first one. And a strategic message is really around what is what is the message we are trying to get across. It's not a strap line. It's not that sort of one liner um, for in the lift, but it's the messages we're trying to get across. Um, so we're trying to show how the Norwegian gifted maps for sustainable development um, data enables Georgia to understand its physical in, in infrastructure and its environment in line with European Union standards and norms, back to that European Union um, integration aspiration, um, and actually the need therefore to understand the part of the country that was not collected using the Norwegian data and keeping it up to date. So that is one strategic message, and there were there were two others, um, which I won't go into in the interest of time, but they're in the slide pack. And then really for communications, that has to be turned into a, a better form of language, if you like. Um, and so we developed um, some, some key points from those three strategic messages. Um, you can see them here. Much easier to explain um, those, but the strategic messages are important because that provides consistency across all of the communications that you deliver. Um, so those are the um, those are the three um, strategic messages, and they are key points in any brief to uh, to senior stakeholders, ministers, and so on. Now, picking up a little bit on what others have said. Um, in terms of trying to drive the financial benefits in Georgia, we had 75 use cases um, and we selected uh, Andy, Andy Coote, myself and Leslie Arnold, um, the third person involved with Georgia, in fact, the leader for the Georgia project, um, selected 10 use cases that could be quantified. Um, and it was those that were then, uh, if you like, chased down to try and understand the financial quantifications um, and some of that was using data from Georgia, and some of it was using um, international data that was then, um, if you like, the benefits transferred specifically um, for Georgia. And I won't go into um, any of those in any detail. Um, I would just like to make a point, though, on global studies for benefits transfer. There are many, um, and these are worth uh, reading and understanding. Um, because it gives a good insight into how geospatial data and services provide real value um, to the end users. Um, now, we had a series of um, actions. I'm going to take a, a, a quick jump across here to the country action plan. The country action plan uh, had 52 actions. In of those were also a series of communications actions. Um, so I was providing a communications plan looking at the data that had been provided and, and how we made use of that. Um, but looking forward, the country level action plan has a series of strategic actions to be taken um, within Georgia. And one of those, uh, number 9.4, was to implement the uh, communications plan that I've just been describing um, and, and, and others there uh, from, from the action plan. Now, I want to close with some lessons. We need to build sustainability into projects from the outset, and part of that sustainability is communications. We have to communicate in a project right from the word go um, how this is going to help the nation, um, and why we're doing it, um, and, and, and what we're trying to get stakeholders to contribute. Um, we need to really understand what makes a country tick. Um, local knowledge is critical in communications planning, 
and the communications plan that we put together uh, was very much built with the stakeholders help um, it wasn't uh, it done done um, sort of externally inwards it was inwards um, out we mustn't overlook defense and security as key use cases now i'd have said that months ago i'd have always said that um, but i think events are telling us that um, at the moment um, global versus um, global versus local economic figures winning national arguments does require local or national figures just throwing international studies at uh, uh, ministers of finance won't work we have to turn it into a, a national story um, and we need to in all of this start getting people using what data we have got because users of data tell their own stories which help the communi communications case um, in any country uh, and lastly finding a champion which is talked about often in the IGIF is very difficult uh, Rumiana, that's everything from me, and I'll close uh, there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Uh, very nice. And so many lessons, and I think like we are learning the, this by doing in every country, every day. Thanks very much. Uh, I took a lot of notes from your presentation. We have a panelist of uh, four people from the projects which were mentioned so far. And we have also Darko from Serbia, who also is managing the socioeconomic benefit analysis through different financial support. So I'm going to introduce all the panelists at once. And then uh, Amy will show on the screen several questions which we sent up front, which we would like them to answer. And then please uh, put your questions uh, on the question and answer box. We don't have any questions so far, but uh, the panelists and the speakers can see the questions if you put some questions so we can be prepared um, in advance. So I'll start with Maria. Maria, we cannot see. Ah, oh, Maria, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, Maria uh, Ovdi yeah, is the head of NSDI department and the secretary to NSDI committee in Moldova working for the Agency for Land uh, Relations in Cadaster. She has been instrumental in gaining the coordination support from a wide range of donors over many years, including the Norwegian Mapping Authority, the World Bank, USAID, JICA, and most recently, the EU through the EU Twinning Project. I have the pleasure to work with Maria for more than a year, so I'm following very well what she's doing, and her team is uh, small, efficient, and they need more help now because the work is growing. You have the action plan, it's not the end, it's the beginning. You have the action plan, then someone should do it and should coordinate it. And it appears that you need many hands to do it. So we have the next one is Darko Bucetic. He is the head of the Center for Geospatial Information Management at the Republic Geodetic Authority of Serbia. And his main activity is to seek and provide the most optimal solutions based on geospatial data management to all public sectors institutions within uh, the NSDI and to ensure a strategic approach for geospatial data use at the national level. The Center of uh, Excellence for Geospatial Information Management apply innovative approaches and technologies, develop fit for purpose solutions, methodologies and business processes and provide capacity building and awareness raising for the usage of geospatial data. Uh, the next speaker is um, Nino Pakia. Uh, she is a head of addressing service at the National Agency of Public Registry under the Ministry of Justice of Georgia since 2018. She received her master's degree in land management from Stockholm Royal Institute of Technology in 2007. And since then, she has been working in various departments of the National Agency of Public Registry, representing one of the core special data producing authorities of Georgia. And the last panelist is Dmitry Makarenko. He's international relations specialist with over 10 years of experience in various government positions in Ukraine. During 2014-20, he was working in the State Service of Ukraine for Geodesy, Cartography and Cadastro. 
and cadaster, and I think you're back now, <laughs> uh, or not. And in 2020, Mitro joined a team of NSDI developers at Research Institute of Geodesy and Cartography to support ongoing geospatial process in the country. In this capacity, he's engaged in the Norwegian-funded project in Ukraine, supporting the implementation of integrated geospatial framework in Ukraine. So welcome all panelists. Um, and it's uh, now time to learn from the spot, from you all directly, how you are using uh, these tools and what were the benefits and what role does socioeconomic impact assessment play in decision making in your country? Is there any change in decision makers already opening eyes and learning more from you? And why it was important to align the geospatial to the government policy drivers? And who are the, typic uh, who are the typical key decision makers in assessing which investments goes where and put the priorities because very hard decisions the government should make now and Ukraine is in a very difficult situation but I'm getting requests from Ukraine for supporting the agriculture and like uh, using geospatial information to see new market uh, roads and uh, access to markets and to meet their commitments for uh, supply with agricultural uh, uh, products uh, locally and internationally. So I think fast learning in Ukraine, <laughs> that geospatial is super important, but we will hear from you. Darko did miracles like in Serbia, they started from zero several years ago and now it's the most popular agency with, uh, with the work they're doing. Maria is also getting high speed. I don't know, George, I never had chance to work in Georgia. I only know the fantastic Georgian food <laughs> and uh, from your many presentations, Georgians are very active in this international event. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And let's see, like, uh, uh, we don't have any order who start first. Like, is there any volunteer from the panelists who want to start first? And you can come back. Like, we have some minutes uh, to hear from you. You can start if you remember something else which you want to add, you can do, do so. So we have good gender equality here. Yeah. So who wants to start? Maybe a bit the brave. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So Nino, the floor is yours. You you mentioned what you want to mention now. And then if you remember something else, you can come back to us. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for this opportunity. And um, again, thanks and thanks to all the persons who were involved in our, in our project uh, who helped uh, to develop the socioeconomic impact assessment and uh, uh, other documents uh, from IGFI. Well, uh, talking about the socioeconomic impact assessment as it uh, um, identifies all impacts uh, uh, for projects and uh, interventions expressed in qu uh, quantity and economic terms, it's, it seems to be a very comprehensive tool to uh, justify for investment and uh, all kinds of decisions. Um, especially for countries uh, like Georgia uh, with limited resources. Uh, with socioeconomic impact assessment, we, uh, we are positioning the value of spatial data and NSDI in a wider social, uh, sociopolitical context. And uh, uh, always when we are talking with the decision makers, they always request from us to um, uh, to have understanding of the impact and assumed benefits of all interventions and projects uh, in terms of finance, in terms of uh, uh, numbers uh, and um, so on. So it's much more easier to talk with the decision makers when you have like the some kind of uh, analyze the uh, which uh, uh, which predicts uh, some um, some numbers and uh, um, uh, results. Uh, so when and again, it's the same for the uh, when we are talking to um, to align 
to policy uh, each kind of intervention and each kind each uh, project. Typically, when the issue is in the governmental agenda uh, or national program, it's easier to push the project forward and gain political support. And uh, the, this tool is really uh, beneficial um, again when we are talking with the decision makers. And uh, who are the decision makers concerning the assessing uh, investments uh, in Georgia? In fact, yeah, this is the Georgian government. However, the initiative um, concerning each, each issue comes from particular ministry. And in case of the spatial data and NSDI, uh, this uh, uh, promoter, the main promoter is the Ministry of Justice with the help of other ministries. So, uh, once again, uh, I should uh, mention that um, uh, all these documents, the social economic impact assessment as well as uh, um, uh, aligning to the you know, policy and uh, all other documents are the great uh, basis to start talking about the new initiative and uh, uh, new projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nino. Thank, thanks a lot. So we'll hear from Maria. <laughs> okay, Maria, go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Rumiana, for your nice introduction. From my side, also, I would like to thank for the, this opportunity to be a part of this event and uh, to greet all the above speakers. Uh, the idea of so social economic impact assessment of NSDI in Moldova definitely plays a very big role in the process of planning assistance by the donors organizations. This evaluation, not only of social and economic aspects, but also of real institutional and organi organizational capacities allows donor organizations to establish the priorities of the country, uh, the origin sectors and the need investment and necessary resources. It is thus crucially important that the institutional framework in developing countries such as Moldova must be adapted for local dynamics of the developing country context. As Andy mentioned about, initial spatial data infrastructure and GIS are collective instruments for value creation. And decision makers need to understand the social economic benefits that uh, NSDI brings to be welfare of the nation for government, for business and for citizens. The cost associated with NSDI remain one of the biggest challenges to developing uh, our country. And we need to draw and approve a clear action plan and business model at the national level in order to consolidate the benef benefits of NSDI. From interviews with IGF implementation in Moldova, with a variety of staff representing 19 stakeholders organization, including government ministries, agencies, state enterprises, and private sector companies, the team identified over 40 applications as use cases uh, where there are dem demonstrable benefits from the implementation of GIS technology requiring foundation geospatial data and the national spatial data would, uh, would provide. As the second question, why it is important to align the two policy driver we can say that uh, even if the Moldova is not a member of the European Union yet, our country invests all the efforts to borrow and implement the best practices existing in the geospatial information sector on the European and international level. The existing policy drivers such as UNGJM uh, and the AJF initiatives, World Bank, EU inspired directives and GSDI are very important for our country. And the transposition of these policy drivers into our national legislation ensures the connection of our country with the international geospatial society, contributing or to the accomplishment of sustainable development goals. Alignment ensures a strong connection between the government institutions and Moldova, and the cooperation between different administrative levels is of crucial importance for achieving high level strategic goals. As competing priorities continue to pile up, a well-aligned and visible strategic plan will help employees 
understand where to focus their attention, ultimately enabling employees to make their own decisions. And as strategic alignment to policy drivers, spatial data infrastructure can support implementing or key public policies in this sector, as is land administration, agriculture and forestry, environment management, economic master planning, e-government, transport, disaster energy management, energy, energy and utilities, health, agriculture, and the other key uh, sectors. Regarding of the last uh, question, who are typically the key decision makers in assessing investments? Uh, usually in our field of activity, our agency for land relations in cadastro uh, as central authority responsible for the geodesy, mapping, cadastral land administration, and SDI, is the first level to evaluate the necessary investment for the sector. The assessment of possible investments are coordinated with state chancellery, representing the government of Moldova, and for sure the Ministry of Finance of Moldova. On the other side, donors organizations <clears throat> try to make their own assessment for of needs, priorities, and the possibility of financial locations. Currently, the biggest donors for geospatial information sector in Moldova are the Norwegian government through National Mapping Authority Kartverke, uh, which assists the Republic of Moldova during the last 16 years. It's a big contribution. Also, <clears throat> Uh, very important donors is the European Union delegation, uh, World Bank, and FAO. We are very grateful for their constant support and financial assistance, which contributes day by day to the sustainable development of the land sector of Moldova. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So, boys, who is first? <laughs> Mitro? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, First of all, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, letting me in, for uh, inviting me to this um, uh, great event. And uh, also, I'm very glad to see and hear my uh, old good friends and uh, uh, current partners. It is a huge honor to be with you today. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for this. Uh, we'll come uh, to the practical uh, issues and to the practical questions. So I will try to uh, make it step by step. Uh, so uh, what role does socioeconomic impact assessment play in the decision making? Uh, I think that uh, Ukraine is um, a very bright example in this uh, issue because um, uh, the history of the NSDI development um, is quite long in the country, uh, but uh, it was uh, more or less theoretical uh, development. Uh, our high-level politicians, uh, they uh, just didn't understand uh, what is the benefit and uh, the real impact of the geospatial information and uh, 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 development of the system itself for the country. And uh, uh, indeed, we, we were very challenging in explaining that on the practice uh, on what we will receive uh, if we develop such such a system. And from the very beginning, we were about to uh, look at this uh, process from the three different positions. Uh, first of all, from the position of the potential investor, so what the potential investor will receive uh, from the operational NSDI. The second one from the uh, official or decision maker, uh, making person and the third one from the uh, ordinary citizen point of view. And uh, finally, we came to the conclusion that um, uh, from the point of view of the investor, he will receive definitely the easy search of uh, the potentially invest areas, the possible permits checking, and uh, uh, he will be able to calculate the investment risks having uh, huge uh, data sets uh, available for the analysis. The um, officials will, will receive, definitely will receive the chance to take the evidence-based uh, decision-making uh, decisions and also to avoid the duplications of the budget funds, uh, having the full information about of what kind of works are being implemented and on which territory. And of course, we were aiming on the 
open data and transparency if talking about the citizens. But uh, unfortunately, after 24th of February, uh, the, uh, probably um, the main goals of uh, NSDI may be reviewed uh, and um, uh, they may be put to the uh, running and burning issues. And uh, at the moment, uh, the government is being discussing uh, what uh, can be uh, done within the NSDI, but for sure the priorities, the top priorities for the country at the moment are uh, providing the food security, uh, the improvement of agricultural logistics uh, using the spatial data and using the satellite images for the yield monitoring and for um, and for avoiding the hunger in, in the region and in the country. That are the top priorities as of now. And also for the, for the future, it is um, uh, definitely that NSDI should be utilized for the, um, uh, for the planning and assessing of the damages and of course for the restoration um, uh, process uh, planning. So that will be done for sure. And uh, I think that uh, um, the concept of NSDI will be slightly uh, changed, uh, but of course with uh, taking into account the uh, great examples and the great uh, background of uh, the uh, uh, assessment that was done with the stakeholders itself, but we should address the, the situation. Regarding the um, alignment to the policy drivers. Uh, as I told uh, uh, before, uh, Ukraine is also a very good example for this because uh, we had 18 years of uh, history of trying and attempts of NSDI, but uh, for that time we did not have uh, any kind of um, uh, true policy uh, drivers to be like a train for the NSDI initiative. And when we receive it, and we receive it like in the form of land reform, uh, so NSDI was uh, very well recognized, uh, meaning that it was included in the package of the land reform and it was supported uh, almost on the all levels of the country. So it was very easy to prove the necessity of NSDI and to, um, to make um, the legislative um, uh, uh, background be accepted by the, by the parliament. But the next challenging step is to implement it itself and we uh, with the good support from the Norwegian Mapping Authority, we managed to uh, to make the uh, socio-economic uh, assessment and IGF imp implementation plan. And at the moment, uh, we have a very detailed analysis of the current situation in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, our challenge is uh, like uh, Maria's challenges. So to make it uh, uh, to make it done and to do all that we. Uh, we were um, talking about and we were uh, investigating. So that will be the uh, main challenge uh, for the for the future. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, that's it. Probably uh, I will have uh, some questions from the chat, and uh, then we'll come come back come back to to the session. Thank you. I'll give the floor to Darko, but you can have a look at the chat box because most of questions are coming in the chat. There is one question for you, uh, the one before the last one. Uh, you can think about it. And uh, Darko, the floor is yours. So. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here. Uh, you know, this is very, you know, actual topic and very important topic for me personally, but also from uh, my institution and my uh, my country. So if I, you know, talk uh, uh, too much and exceed this, uh, this limit in the time, please, Rumiana, stop me. Uh, so I want to say, uh, you know, to, to describe what, uh, you know, uh, what is the benefit uh, for uh, from social economic, uh, you know, study in, uh, in Serbia. Uh, according to the IGIF and so on, I will, uh, you know, go back in uh, 2016. Until 2016, you know, we invested a lot uh, in the technology, in uh, people, in uh, in data and so on and so on. And uh, within my organization, we started um, under the umbrella of NSDI, we started to, to build new geoportal, new data production and so on and so on. 
And then in 2016, Rumiana uh, personally you know, came to, uh, came to me and, and Catherine and to uh, to uh, some uh, to to do some kind of uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tool to use diagnostic tool for NSDI, and results were quite uh, you know astonished because it turned that we are quite good in technology in uh, data even. And uh, and uh, and other things, but uh, the the you know the truth was and conclusion was that uh, the purpose and the usage usage of these data and these uh, these things were on very very low level, and that was the purpose why we were doing that. So we invested a lot then uh, on the other you know we put some kind of re reorganization of the institution, people, uh, business processes, regulation, and we worked uh, a lot with uh, our stakeholders and. When we uh, do that diagnostic uh, tool again in 2019, it was quite, quite uh, much, much better. Um, as a key driver for us, it's actually integrated geospatial information framework and uh, 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 Inspire Directive. Uh, the, in 2019, we started to think about, you know, because there are nine paths. Uh, which is the priority for for Serbia? Uh, you know, and uh, you know, shall we start all all the all the all the um, uh, in in parallel because everything is uh, quite important. And so then we decided to do first this um, uh, action, uh, social economic benefit and action plan on the based on this. It was conducted by the within the World Bank project improvement of land administration, and in, uh, it was pre performed in the period of June 2020 and April 2021. The main, let's say, objective of, of, of this study was to present uh, and to define a clear and concise analysis of the social economic benefits of the NSDI. In, in line with the IGAF and the INSPIRE Directive. The outcomes uh, of the study include a report on geospatial alignment to the policy driver, report on the social economic benefits study on the Serbian NSDI, action plan, very detailed action plan with the, with the investments and so on. And also we updated our strategy uh, and, uh, and other strategic documents based on the, on the, on the we identified during the, 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 the study, you know, more than 32 national strategies and policies that are quite important for, for our work and for geospatial data and more than 20 international commitments, uh, 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 which is uh, actually can, can uh, improve um, by the geospatial data. And uh, I need to underline that uh, uh, this social economic study, we worked a lot with uh, other stakeholders. Uh, it was more than uh, than 56, uh, you know, uh, public institution, private companies, 25% of private companies, and so on. And it, that's actually we use that. I, I see now as a, as a, uh, you know uh, to provide information and capacity building for them, you know, to understand uh, much better. Uh, how they can use uh, geospatial data. We worked very, you know, I had a, a, a huge team in a, in a Republic Geodetic Authority, and it's uh, it was um, uh, you know led by the Yub Kronfots, uh, and we provided a lot of information and got the feedback, you know, how we can improve much better, you know, the, all these sectors. As a result, you know, there is a clear action plan which is actually a very concrete uh, way how geospatial data will improve some sectors. For example, uh, in one of the key, uh, key uh, let's say, sector that, uh, that needs uh, urg urgently at that time to be improved, it's emergency uh, and agriculture and spatial and urban planning. Uh, we started immediately to work with the Ministry of Internal and Sector for Emergency and we built uh, we built some kind uh, some um, uh, information system for disaster risk uh, resilience. And now the yesterday it was the the the, the launch of that of that of that platform. And it was uh, we are we were the the, the key guests and uh, every everybody were very delighted because finally they have proper tool for their decision making for prevention reaction and uh, and uh, reconstruction of the of the uh, you know in case of the of the emergency floods landslides and so on uh, today i am the key speaker in the in the spatial uh, spatial and urban uh, urban planning uh, main conference uh, and we are building new uh, information system for for them on the on the national level uh, it's called it e space and many other things so the result of this action action um, uh, action uh, social economic study 
and um, and uh, action plan it's really clear and concise the the way forward and uh, with which way we need to invest time money resources and so on to get the best benefits and benefits are huge you know there is a ratio that um, um, andre and, uh, and, uh, and and john said in serbia in uh, in uh, only in 3 to 5 years it's 1 to 5 so every uh, euro invested in the in geospatial data but on the good way and the proper way uh, it turned back uh, it, uh, as a five euro to the government to the citizens of serbia uh, the other thing there are many uh, use cases very detailed uh, use cases uh, how we can um, you know save uh, to improve the so social impact of the geospatial data, especially for formalization. I remind you that uh, in Serbia there are more than four million, you know, buildings informal, informal, um, uh, informal buildings, and this is the the debt capital. This is the economic uh, side. It's uh, estimated more than 36 billion euros that is, uh, you know, uh, kept in, uh, in, um, in 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 that way. But on the other side, there is also very huge social impact because those uh, those uh, people people are not able to uh, sell the, to, to sell or to, to, to regarding transaction and they can't you know uh, ter, uh, you know plug in the the gas or or electricity and many other social I I impacts uh, you know on, on the daily lives there are many also use cases that will not take too, too much time but based on this we also uh, recognize the, the the gaps between uh, current status and how we should uh, govern, govern uh, you know, uh, these kind of things uh, the, 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 to improve the impact of the social economy, so of the geospatial data. Uh, the next, um, uh, we also worked uh, very hard uh, on the, uh, with our partners uh, to build the um, NSDI business model and the document is also you know finished everything is based on the action plan and social economic uh, study we we make a business plan and now it's a, it's a time for big changes and transformation uh, in serbia i would like also to underline that uh, uh, in the same time we were uh, obliged to obliged i mean uh, we 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 planned this uh, within the negotiation uh, process with EU, uh, we uh, have developed a specific implementation plan for Inspire Directive. So the whole uh, action uh, action plan and the social and economic impact and business plan business, uh, is actually you know uh, now position of Republic of Serbia for negotiation process uh, with uh, EU. So the there there are also very huge benefits for example for decision makers because uh, when you have this social economic impact and uh, real concre uh, concrete results of this uh, now there are no uh, projects that are identified in uh, in social in social economic study and action plan that started in serbia uh, that uh, RGA and NSDI Council and NSDI people are not informed about and also asked to help and to improve the, the plan, their plan action plans to deliver those system on the go the proper way. There are also the politicians that uh, that are uh, you know, taking care of, about this, but also our partners from the other institutions as well. So the awareness rising, thanks to this social economic study, was on a very high level. So I will not uh, uh, take uh, too much of your time, but there are many you know, other things. And I would like to say that uh, those uh, social economic uh, uh, study and business model is publicly available on our website. And I will you know, uh, uh, inform uh, or our, our, our friends uh, uh, today, you know, about the links and how they can access. There are on. We can put the links uh, on the chat box. Uh, yeah. Is it available in English also? Yes. Yes, yes. So on English, both okay. both documents, uh, except oh. these, the financial part. Uh, so everything, right. uh, action plan, uh, policy drivers, everything is. Uh, okay. so, with the, the geospatial data also improved the, the transparency, you know, in the in the country. So we are now we are used to, you know, to implement in every every segment, even for the documentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks. There are several questions. One is uh, question is: Is there resilience from the governments and citizens to open access to data? Like also the speakers are invited to comment or the panelists, like. I know like uh, every agency tried to keep the data for themselves, but during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was emergency when many data were made available for various other purposes. And I think people slowly are learning that it's not, 
only your agency data, but you can benefit from using other people data and also sharing your data. So I think uh, it's less uh, <laughs> resistance now from what I see. But Darko, you wanted to mention something like you had to separate uh, open data portal, which didn't have any geospatial data and you had your uh, GeoServia. I think you were trying to integrate the two and uh, there was no much understanding before to open data, but I think things are changing fast. So Darko, you wanted to comment. Please. Yeah, we, we managed to integrate those those mm -hmm. uh, two portals. So, you know, it's uh, it, we are quite happy. So every single, you know, the data sets that are actually provided through the pro platform, new data sets like from Ministry of Culture and uh, addresses and so on are open right now on the on the portal. But, uh, you know, uh, we are not uh, we don't plan to to keep or to have attention to keep those data because uh, to be honest, you know, I never use the geospatial data. I'm just, you know, producing and providing. So, you know, this, uh, this is our task. Not, not you are to using when you're driving. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, uh, but the point, the point is that, uh, okay, the, the open data is, uh, you know, I think that our task is to, to open uh, on data, but it needs to be followed by the proper um, you know, business and organization model, uh, because uh, we need to provide uh, constant, uh, efficient and modern access to those data who are open. So that costs something. And it's a it's a topic for you know negotiation between the government and the, our institutions. You know how to deliver that in the proper way and how to how to do that. You know what what are the you know uh, uh, what we need to do that. So this um, uh, uh, to be honest, this, uh, this is uh, including included in a, uh, in action plan, and it's also promotion of the open standards and open uh, open uh, softwares. And uh, in the business model, it's a huge attention, you know, uh, 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 actually uh, for this open data. Yes, we have it, but we plan to do, you know, as much as possible. Yeah, and um, just for people who are not familiar with the tools which Catherine was presenting, uh, <clears throat> there are questions about in IGF about the open data because they're important for building new businesses and for economic development and for many other purposes. And Darko, I think you did several hackathons to promote the using of open data and young people programmers were coming with uh, interesting solutions. When you announce which data are open, they can use it for some period of time. And then you have uh, also some main topics for which you want to increase the use of data. For example, you need uh, uh, to resolve some issues in agriculture or other things. So then you can mention several points where you're looking for solutions. There are very many smart people. When you say these data are available, they're open, you can download, you can reuse them. And uh, people are coming with very interesting solutions, which maybe not everybody have in mind, but then they come with some solutions, you pick up something. So anyone who wants to comment about the open data in their countries? Uh, probably I will take the floor. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, first uh, uh, of all, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, comment on the open data, and then uh, I will try to um, uh, give an um, uh, answer to the Andy's uh, question in the chat. Uh, yeah, the open data policy in Ukraine generally was introduced uh, starting from uh, uh, 2015, and it was uh, rather the very well uh, developing initiative. Uh, even the open data portal was uh, introduced and uh, uh, the agencies and uh, uh, from the central level and the field from the municipal level were storing their data to that portal. It wa uh, this data wasn't of the geospatial origin, so there, uh, there was um, a lot of data uh, in uh, Excel, uh, in Word, so in PDF, uh, but whatever. Uh, still, these data were considered to be open, uh, starting from um, when the NSDI law was um, uh, adopted by the parliament, uh, the um, open policy for the geospatial data was uh, introduced uh, and uh, uh, most agencies, uh, they were uh, rather happy to hear about this open data approach and uh, step by step they were about to open uh, their data sets, if any, and uh, connecting them to the NSDI. But of course, 
taking into account the current uh, situation in the country, I think that uh, uh, probably this open uh, cartographic and geospatial data approach will be terminated for some time. And then uh, uh, I assume that uh, the government will take the decision how to how to move uh, further with that open open initiatives. Uh, regarding the question uh, uh, from Andrew, um, yeah, so you have both successfully engaged with top politicians. Uh, what are the key lessons you have learned? Uh, from my experience, I uh, want to say that uh, uh, I had uh, direct um, uh, meetings with uh, uh, the minister, uh, with the prime minister and with the president while presenting uh, the uh, NSDI. And um, uh, all these meetings were, uh, were done under the um, motto transparency, transparency and open information and avoiding uh, and preventing uh, corruption. If talking about minister, he put uh, a very uh, big attention to uh, analytical block. Uh, he even initiated uh, the opening information about uh, land-related uh, violations that we are conducting during some period, uh, and these data are available on the pilot geoportal of NSDI. Uh, the Prime Minister, uh, he put um, uh, very much attention to the decentralization issues and to, uh, to the regional development of the independent uh, conglomerated communities in Ukraine, and he was uh, pushing and uh, trying to engage as much uh, data from the local level, level to be um, uh, integrated with the national uh, geo portal. So it was his position. And um, uh, the uh, president, he was uh, just happy that uh, such uh, anti-corruption initiative may be utilized in the country and uh, the information is becoming uh, open and uh, uh, easy to access and uh, uh, so he was just uh, 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 telling that uh, it is very easy to control uh, and to take uh, measures to avoid and prevent uh, uh, corruptions but uh, the lessons that that you have learned it is very important not to promise too much uh, because the system itself it's the tool it may not give you any answer or any solution uh, that may help you to solve any problem. It is a good tool that you may utilize uh, and then to compare uh, between the different data sets to take, uh, to, to conduct the geospatial analysis, you may take appropriate, uh, appropriate decision. Uh, but the system itself will never generate you the decision. And uh, anyway, the role of the official or the the one who is taking the decision is uh, uh, very big in this process. So that is very important to remember. Thank you. We are very close to the end of this webinar. Uh, I think uh, there are some comments uh, on the chat. Uh, I don't see much new questions. It's about Andy mentioned that uh, open data doesn't mean necessarily free data. If you make the data free, then you lose data quality if there is no government <laughs> support behind that. So you need money to make the data free. There are countries which, like uh, Denmark, making all data free, but then the government is financing all the update of data and the maintenance of the data. So money should come from somewhere. So we are never pushing only to open the data. Uh, you open data which can be used. Uh, but then it's another policy for making data freely available or upon payment or anti mention some kind of uh, additional payment of service which you create or something like uh, should be some balance to guarantee that data are maintained and they're kept in good quality. So we learned today a lot, like starting from uh, Catherine's presentation about the tools available. I really recommend those who doesn't have action plans on NSDI to try to find small financing or small project to do all these series of baseline assessment takes short. It doesn't go very deep, but like you screen quickly what you have, what you don't have. Then you go to policy drivers and see where the government top priorities are, not to invest for invest, not to spend money for geospatial because of geospatial, but to try to help to resolve 
the most pressing issues. It's valid also for the big cities, like if they have traffic jam, if they have water problem, if they have um, other things problems. So they're looking for fast and cheaper solution. And this is how you can see where the, the problems are and how you can help. And then you go with this socioeconomic benefit analysis um, and dimension and also the previous speakers. If you don't have enough money to do deep data collection and analysis in the country, you can pick up several use cases and then use uh, this methodology for benefits transfer when country with similar cases already did it. So you can say we are close to this. So in this case, they have so much benefits. Uh, and it doesn't mean directly that your country will have the same benefits because it depends what decisions your government will make and in which directions they will go. So it's a local content always, but like, for justification purpose, you can show the potential, uh, not to promise too much, as Mitro said, but like you can show that there is a breadth in this. Then we heard John, uh, who said like, you have these economists giving you all these numbers, but you have to have people who know how to communicate, who know how to present this information so people understand. I remember Gavin Adlington was saying he was thinking, he's talking to the country manager to convince for some project and he was doing arguments and he said it doesn't go, he doesn't understand. Then he took economists who did the economic uh, assessment and he said, I was thinking, he repeated exactly what I said, but the country manager immediately said, oh yes, I will give money for this. So you need people who really know how to do it and who are economists. You think you know, but maybe you don't know exactly how to present. It's very important. We heard from several countries which recently did the action plans and the socioeconomic benefit analysis. And we see that uh, these things are helping. It's not easy. Catherine said it's out of the uh, area of confidence which the jail special people have to go with socioeconomic benefit analysis. But then once you have these cards in your pocket, and you know, also said it's very much more easy to go to the minister and to put your arguments there. Uh, so it's a very rich uh, session and I want to thank to all of you, special thanks to Dmitro, he's uh, connecting from Ukraine now, <laughs> uh, that you managed to, to join, uh, very much appreciated, Nino, Darko and Maria, all your efforts like will be paid off, like you'll be very famous, <laughs> you're doing a lot. Uh, and thanks to all the consultants who joined and who shared their experience and for all your support. Also to the Norwegian government, UNEC, for supporting this and for making uh, this experience popular. I saw Maria put online the, uh, the link where you can find the study from Moldova, right? Maria, yes. And Darko, did you put your links? Just sent on the on the on the, yeah. on the chat. On the chat, yeah. Okay, we can copy from there, and when we send the recorded session, we can put also the links in the message so people who want to to learn more. If the other speakers have something which they want to share, you can put it, or other or from the participant sites as well. Uh, so please feel free to send some useful information and links. And with this, we are one minute late, according to my <laughs> um, uh, my time. So I will close the session with big thank you to all speakers uh, and uh, all who spend their time to listen. And if there are any questions, you are invited. Catherine invited you to come back to her with uh, the request for templates and all others who are here. I think they'll be happy to share more information. Thanks a lot. Stay healthy. Good luck with all your plans and see you soon somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Rumiana. Thank you, Rumiana. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.